Hello guys, my name is Sig and welcome back to another video. Before we get started, make sure you like, comment and subscribe and make sure that you turn on notifications so that you can see the next time that we upload. Today, we have a section on St. John Cassian, one of the great monks of the early church period and a great recorder of monastic history. If you do like content like this, make sure you follow me on Twitch where I discuss these topics live. And with that being said, away we go. And John Cassian is a very particular guy. He's very important to us because what he does is he, as a monk, records the life of the monks. Okay. Now, okay. Again, this is very important. I'm just going to go open and look at what he was in his life, right? By the Catholic Encyclopedia. And then we're going to go on Orthodox Wiki. Why are we going on Orthodox Wiki? Well, because if I recall this correctly, both of these people actually give like two different notions on who he was. Look at this, right? Let me just open up the mainstream. It's very important when you're looking at like the apprehension of a specific saint that you look at the way that they're viewed in two ways. Okay. So first of all, if you guys like this kind of content where I'm sort of talking softly, I'm not really hyper reacting, but I'm teaching. Okay, then it's cool. Bro, on God, you're going to be one of those dudes. People are going to say, oh my God, you want to six mods. Dang, how did that happen? You're going to have an IP size cut. Listen, if I do, it, 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 will, it will only be to the glory of God. Okay. So, as we can see, John Cassian is a beautiful saint in the Orthodox Church. A, an amazing saint in the Orthodox Church. Okay. And he's a monastic saint known for his writings on the monastic life and for correctives of the anti-Pelagian writings of St. Augustine of Hippo. So what's important is John Cassian, just to make sure that you know his date, born around 360, died around in the 430s, basically had the same sort of lifespan and career as Augustine himself, okay? But what was interesting is that he came into conflict he came into conflict with Augustine, as in the ideas of St. John Cassian came into conflict with the ideas of Augustine. And what happened was people accused John Cassian of being something that we call a semi-Pelagian, okay? A semi-Pelagian is just someone that in some sense affirms Pelagianism or the conclusions of their moral theology, uh, not, sorry, not moral theology, of their soteriology lead them to some form of Pelagianism. And it's, it, it's because of an overemphasis of works regarding uh, the salvific economy, okay? Thank you for South Africa, man. We appreciate you guys. All the way in South Africa is crazy, okay? Now, here is the problem. If you notice the soteriology in the Eastern Orthodox Church and you notice the soteriology in the Western Hemisphere of the Church, you will see that the way that both groups articulate salvation actually play into the reason why John Cassian is viewed the way that he is in both churches. So according to the EOs, I just want to write this out. Bear in mind, John Cassian is a respected figure in both churches. Here, I'll show you guys what's going on here, right? That's what we're writing down. John Cassian, again, was a guy that focused on the monastic tradition. And he sort of, if you think about his moral actions, he's sort of a Palamas before Palamas. And a Palamas in the West. And what I mean by that is he is a monastic theologian and as such prioritizes a lot of the way that he views salvation, moral theology, philosophy through the contemplative and spiritual tradition. Where we have the Eastern Fathers, we have John Cassian in the West. Now, according to the Roman Catholics, if you read the Catholic Encyclopedia and you read a lot of Catholic documentation on this, he was accused of being a semi-Pelagian. And it was particularly in his 13th institute sorry in his 13th conference with which he wrote around 18 or 19 in conference number 13 he talks about well, he talks about a semi-pelagian ideal 
And you can see this here in the Kafka Encyclopedia if you open it. Right here, Kafka Encyclopedia notes that Cassian himself did not escape the suspicion of erroneous teaching. He, in fact, is regarded as the originator of what, since the Middle Ages, has been known as semi-Pelagianism. Views of this character attributed to him are found in his third, fifth, but more principally, his 13th conference. And we'll go through the 13th conference soon. Preoccupied as he was with moral questions, again, his moral theology led into this, he exaggerated the role of free will. Look at how they word it here. He exaggerated the role of free will by claiming that the initial steps to salvation were in the power of each individual, unaided by grace. The teaching of Cassian on this point was a reaction against what he regarded as the exaggerations of Augustine in his treatise De Corruptione et Gratia where he basically affirms the incorruptibility and irresistibility of, of grace. And Cassian saw in the doctrine of St. Augustine an element of fatalism. And while endeavoring to find a middle way between the opinions of the great bishop of Hippo and Pelagius, he put forth views which were only less erroneous than those of the heresiarch himself. He did not deny the doctrine of the fall, he even admitted the existence and necessity of an interior grace, which supports the will in resisting temptations. But after he maintained that, after but he maintained that after the fall, there remained in every soul some seeds of goodness implanted by the kindness of the Creator. And here's the problem that was created when this understanding was sort of pushed in the West. The Western theologians said, "You know what? This." is crazy this is against augustine and for the west augustine was the bulwark of soteriology he is what we call the doctor of grace the teacher of grace because his work on grace ultimately is foundational for any western and, and thus catholic theologian the theology of aquinas is the theology of augustine in this sense and so the legacy of john cassian even though he was a great a moral theologian, his work is left to be understood as semi-Pelagian. But what about the Eastern Orthodox? See, with the Eastern Orthodox, which is funny for me, right? The Eastern Orthodox, they believed that John Cassian himself should actually be regarded as a holy saint because what he did was he corrected Augustine. The guy literally threw his scholars under bus, both theologians and textual criticism. What? No. Anyways, focus. The EOs see him as correcting the forward theology of Augustine. And so Cassian is seen as a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church. He's seen as a very good theologian in the Eastern Orthodox Church. So let's recap. Cassian, according to many people in the Western tradition, he's seen as a semi-Pelagian. But in the Eastern tradition, he's seen as an amazing guy. He corrected Augustine, especially when the Eastern Christians will have to deal with how to interpret and how to understand um, Augustine. You know, his views on the filioque, his views on divine simplicity, his views on contemplation. All of these things um, for Eastern Orthodoxy especially have sort of strained the relationship that in the modern day they have with Augustine. And so people like John Cassian, especially in his work on soteriology, it's like Mwah, chef's kiss. Look at that. See, he's saying Augustine went a bit too far. We qualify the teachings of Augustine under St. John Cassian. But there is still a reason why Augustine is accepted higher in some sense as a moral theologian, not just as a moral theologian, sorry, but as a patristic theologian than John Cassian. Well, it's because people received him easier and people received him more. So that's the context, right? And here is a life of him, okay? In 382, he entered a monastery in Bethlehem. And after several years, there was granted permission, along with his friend St. Germanus of Dobrogea, to visit the Desert Fathers in Egypt. So we get one of the first recorded events of Western monks going and visiting Eastern monks and actually recording how the Eastern monks lived. And that's what we're going to go through today, okay? 
They remained in Egypt until 399, except for a brief period when they returned to Bethlehem and were released from the monastery there. Upon leaving Egypt, they went to Constantinople, where they met St. John Chrysostom, who ordained John Cassian as a deacon. He had to leave Constantinople in 403 when Chrysostom was exiled. So Chrysostom was kicked out, eventually settling close to Marseille, where he was ordained priest and founded two monasteries, one for women, one for men. Now, this is really cool because Cassian, okay, he was born in Romania, okay? He was born in the West. But then he gets his education as a monk in the East. He goes to Egypt, where the monastic tradition, where the desert fathers are really strong there. And he goes there, he learns, you know, he, he gets a really good understanding of monasticism. And, and this is sort of couched into his theology. This is really cool. But then after you know, being promoted to a deacon and now he's taking part in the holy orders themselves. After all of this, he then dips. He dips into France. Okay. Well, the contemplative theology, uh, where the contemplative theology of Irenaeus is still very much apparent. St. John's most famous works are the Institutes, which detail how to live the monastic life, and the Conferences, which provide details of conversations between John and Germanus and the Desert Fathers. So, why are we looking at the conferences instead of the institutes? We will look at a little bit at the institutes, but it's because for Cassian, the conferences are actually a conversation between East and West, between Eastern contemplative tradition and Western contemplative tradition. And as you will see, there is not only a lot of overlap, but a lot of growth that actually happens within the time of St. John Cassian. Okay. Now, he also according to the Eastern Orthodox narrative, warned against some of the excesses in St. Augustine of Hippo's theology while refraining from criticizing him by name. For this reason, he has sometimes been accused of semi-Pelagianism by the Catholics and by Protestant commentators. St. John died peacefully in 435. Now, for those of the Eastern Orthodox that think that St. John Cassian isn't a saint in their church, this is a troparion that is sung in your churches constantly. Okay, and in fact, this is sung on February the 29th every year. So around next month, okay, which is the leap year for this year, okay, next month on the leap year, you will sing this song. Having been, and this is for the Christians in America, having been purified through fasting, you attained the knowledge of the wisdom of the God-bearing fathers who lived in the desert. This is what he's remembered for and learned to restrain the passions. Therefore, by your prayers, grant that our flesh may be obedient to our spirit. For you, O venerable Cassian, are the teacher of all those in Christ who glorify your memory. So for those Eastern Orthodox like saying, oh no, John Cassian's not a saint, he's not a saint, he's not a saint. No, no, he's definitely a saint in your church. Okay? So, what's that even, what's going on here? The contachion is even stronger. As a venerable monk, O John Cassian, you consecrated your life to God and radiant with virtue, you shone like the sun with the splendor of your divine teachings, always enlightening the hearts of all who honor you, earnestly entreat Christ on behalf of those who praise you with fervent love. So he's a saint. He's defo, a saint, a blessed saint at that in Eastern Orthodoxy. Okay? Because you sing to him and you sing about him. Okay? Right. If you look at this, look at that. This is affirming that he's alive in heaven. This is Troparion Tone 8. And again, this is sung on the 29th of February, I believe. The image of God was truly preserved in you, O Father, for you took up the cross and followed Christ. For by doing so, you taught us to disregard the flesh, for it passes away, but instead to care for the soul since it's immortal. Therefore, your spirit, venerable John Cassian, rejoices with the angels. So according to the Eastern Orthodox, he's in heaven. But I just want to check if John Cassian is actually a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. He's definitely an ascetic. Uh, no, he is definitely venerated in Catholicism, I believe. Uh, but I just need to check whether he actually is venerated in the Catholic Church. Yes, he does. Yeah. 
In fact, I'll actually, I'm going to get the date right now for you guys. There you go. This is the calendar of saints. I believe the 23rd of July does have John Cassian in here. There you go. Look at that. So these are the saints that are all venerated. Okay. On the 23rd. And if you scroll all the way down here, who do you see? The one, the only John Cassian. So John Cassian is a saint in the church. He is a saint, but he's been criticized as being a semi-Pelagian. Okay, he's been criticized as being a semi-Pelagian, and the reason is is because he responds to Augustine. Someone said Sig will still wear his bandana even after entering heaven, bro. Listen, I will take off my bandana when I'm in heaven. Yeah, don't don't disrespect TikTok chat. You man are doing amazing today, man. You man are doing amazing. So there you go. He is a saint in both the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. But bear in mind his moral theology, okay? His moral theology is the thing that influences greatly his soteriology. And that's very common for the Eastern Fathers. That's very common for the monks of the period. Their moral theology ultimately influences their soteriology. Or rather, you could think of their moral theology as being in some sense equal to their soteriology, okay? Right, so let's get into the meat and potatoes, man. Okay, that's the little bit of the life of John Cassian from the Eastern perspective and the Western perspective. Now, I want to show you some quotes and I want to show you some cool stuff and then we can get into like having a, a, a conversation, discussion. Okay, I want to show you some quotes. I want to show you some stuff from what John Cassian actually said about the preservation of the church and the preservation of the church um, in his day, and actually what they did. Remember the claim that Muslims make that Christians don't pray seven times a day? Right? The monastic tradition affirms how fervently they, play, they pray. Okay? It says here, and so in the monasteries, and this is in his third institute, okay? This is in his third institute, chapter three. And in the monasteries of Palestine and Mesopotamia and all the East, the services of the above mentioned hours are ended each day with three Psalms apiece so that constant prayers may be made. Constant prayers may be made to God at the appointed times. So these appointed times, and this is really important. These appointed times are going to be identical to the seven times a day that an individual is meant to pray. Okay. Um, people were mandated to pray seven times a day for the righteous rules. And this is instantiated actually, not just in the Eastern tradition with John Cassian, but in the Western tradition with St. Augustine. And I will show both of these right now. Okay. Just give me a second, guys. If I got them, if I can, some, a chat, can someone send me a map that I can edit of the Eastern and Western Roman empire, please? Chat, can someone get me a map of the empire? If you can do that, you're the MVP. If you can do that, you're the MVP. Get me a get me a map. That's what I want. I want a, I want a map. Okay. So this is Augustine's letters to a monastery. And in this letter to a monastery, which is really cool. Okay. Um he actually talks about again and again this is not an eastern monastery this is a western monastery okay this is augustine in the west and then john cassian who got his teachings in the east and then transferred over to france to just carry on the same life that he was living this is what he says this is augustine and you guys can read that it's actually really cool be regular which is in state in prayers at the appointed hours and times, the seven times a day that you pray. In the oratory, let no one do anything else than the duty of which, for which the place was made and from which it has reserved its name. So that if any of you having leisure, 
Let me just change the color of that so you can see. Wish to pray at other hours than those appointed. They may not be hindered by others using the place for any other purpose. In the Psalms and hymns used in your prayers to God, let that be pondered in the heart which is uttered by the voice. Chant nothing but what you find prescribed to be chanted. Whatever is not so prescribed is not to be chanted. So again, bear in mind that Augustine is in Hippo Regius. Okay? And Cassian is in Egypt, goes to Constantinople or Byzantium. Okay? And he's in France. He goes to Lyon and he lives there. If you find it very interesting that both the Eastern and Western tradition both agree on the same thing. The appointed times are not just a Western idea or an Eastern idea. It's both ideas. Look at John Cassian here. Okay. John Cassian says, And so in the monastery of Palestine and Mesopotamia and all the East, the services of the above mentioned hours are ended each day with three Psalms apiece. Remember the Psalms that Augustine was talking about previously? Three Psalms apiece, so that constant prayers may be offered to God at the appointed times. And yet, the spiritual duties being completed with due moderation, the necessary offices of work may not be in any way interfered with. For at these three seasons, we know that Daniel the prophet also poured forth his prayers to God day by day in his chamber with the windows open. So the three prayers, we have seven prayers. Let me just get my pen, guys. So we have three prayers that are offered up, okay? And those are going to be as a result of the prayers that Daniel has. And then you have four other prayers, okay? So I'm going to show you how the seven prayers actually came to be theologically instituted, okay? First of all, we need to take a quick turn to the Bible, okay? Okay? And if you go to the book of Psalms, you go to chapter 119, right? The longest chapter in the Bible. And you go to verse 164. So this is going to take some scrolling, significant scrolling. If you go to all the way to verse 164, what you see there is David sets this institution up, right? This is a scriptural truth that David sets up. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Wow. There you go. Seven times a day, I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Okay? So David praises God seven times a day. He, he, he prays to God seven times a day. Okay? Now, chat, as you can see there, that's David speaking, right? Seven times a day, he praises God because of his righteous rules. Okay? Now, here's the issue. Those, time, those times a day, okay, became to be known as the seven prayers. We have the hours of the day where the apostles themselves would pray. For instance, if you go to the book of Acts, Peter and Paul were walking to the 3 p.m. prayer, the three o'clock prayer. Okay. Now, I'm going to just draw this out for you guys, chat. I'm going to draw this out for you. If you look at Daniel, right? Daniel had three prayers, okay? Okay. Okay, so this, these are the three prayers. These are the six, seven prayers that we do. If you read the writings of John Cassian, John Cassian says, John Cassian says that you pray three times a day because of Daniel. So this is in morning, noon, and night. So when you get up, midday, and right about as you're about to go to bed. Jesus, if you notice in the scriptures, Jesus had three hours dedicated. The third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour. Those hours were taken monastically to be the specific hours where Jesus dedicated to be prayed. So we pray at those times. We pray at those instituted times because those are the times that Jesus Christ said to be uh, said to die. Now, 
these ideas don't just start in John Cassian, but they actually go back as far as Clement of Rome. Okay? And if you actually open up Clement of Rome, you will see this so uh, interestingly. Open up Clement of Rome right here. Okay? And all you need to do is head over to chapter 40. If you go to chapter 40, okay, he actually talks about the things that were manifested to us. Let us preserve in the church the order appointed by God. These things, therefore, being manifest to us, and since we look into the depths of divine knowledge, so this is in the first century. These seven times a day prayers are in the first century. It behooves us to do all things in their proper order, which the Lord has commanded us to perform at stated times. He has enjoined offerings to be presented and services to be performed to him, and that not thoughtlessly or irregularly, so not random times, but at the appointed times and hours. So these prayers happen at specific times in the day. The precedent is in the first century of the Christian church. The existence of prayers is in the first century. So with that being said, all John Cassian is doing is looking at how these things are formalized. How do these things gain structure? How do these things gain understanding? How do these things grow with the numbers of people in Christianity that grow alongside it? How do those things work? That's where John Cassian comes in. Okay? So, whoa, 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 whoa. Someone just, thank you so much for the follow. Thank you so much for the follow. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for the follow. Make sure you're subbing to the Twitch, yeah? Make sure you sub to the Tink. Okay, sub to the tink. I believe. Uh... Give me one second, guys. I'm trying to find something, something, something. I'm trying to find something, 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 something. I'm trying to find something. Just to clarify as well, people are gonna people are gonna wonder. Okay, where does this night prayer come from? Like this night prayer, this prayer in the middle of the night that we do. Like where does that where does that come from? Well, my friend, I turn you to the book of Psalms again. Okay, right. If you go to Psalm 119, we're staying here, right? In this acrostic poem, go all the way to verse 62. That's all you got to do. What does it say there? At midnight, I will rise to give thanks to you. At midnight, I will rise to give thanks to you. So Christians, you are meant to do this. It is our fault that we slack and that's fine. But you must improve, guys. And in fact, I need to improve. I need to hold myself accountable. Okay? I need to hold myself accountable. Don't think that I'm going to be exempt. I, well, I'm terrible at this. I am so terrible with my timekeeping. But the Christian faith is that we do pray seven times a day. This is something that's always been done for thousands of years, since the first century till now. Thank you so much for watching that video guys if you did enjoy that sort of content make sure you do like comment and subscribe and make sure that you turn on the notification bell to see the next time that we do upload with that being said have a wonderful day enjoy yourselves and have a much better day than me